So let's go slideshow. Okay, so um, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of became the uh, color expert at Wolfram. So uh, when, when I noticed that we had like this uh, extra talk uh, allotted to our, our image processing team, I decided to fill it uh, with um, uh, color processing and, and how, how you can do, uh, I mean, how, how you can work and what you can do with colors in Mathematica. So I'll, I'll try to be extremely brief uh, in the introductive uh, part, but I think it's still worth it to mention where, I mean, what color are, uh, why should you care, and, and I mean, the internals, a bit the internals uh, um, about like color representation in Mathematica. So I get that, um, I guess that many, many of you knows about this, like everybody coming from, from physics will know what a black body is, and for, for who, uh, is not from, a, that, that doesn't have a physics background, basically every object uh, at, at a given temperature will emit light or let's say electromagnetic radiation. The point is we don't see the whole ele electromagnetic spectrum, so we usually just notice stuff that emits light uh, between a certain interval of temperatures, like here, this scale here is in Kelvin. So for example, the sun uh, is like 3000 Kelvin and this is why we see sunlight and we don't see like everybody shining. But if you use an infrared camera, you will, you will see everybody shining actually. And so that said, so uh, we have an interval of, of, of temperature where like stuff will emit light and we also have an interval of uh, in our like own detector. Our eyes are a light detector, electro electromagnetic radiation detector, but they do not work at, at every uh, frequency or, or wavelength. So uh, this is, uh, whoops, it's too big probably. And besides being too big, is uh, w what part of the electromagnetic spectrum we can see. So these basically are the colors that can like, be analyzed by your, your visual system. So how, how, how do you get colors? So le le let's move like, to something a bit more concrete. So in, in the eyes, we have three kinds of cells, and, uh, and they are sensible like, to different set of wavelengths. And, and these here are uh, the sensitivities of all the cells. So you see that like, it, it, they degrade really quickly when, once you are out of the uh, comfort zone between 400 uh, um, nanometers and like, uh, 700 nanometers. So given that we have like, three kind of independent uh, photoreceptor, it was kind of obvious to represent colors with three coordinates. And, and this, this is why actually it's so convenient to represent colors with three color co with uh, three numbers. Uh, otherwise it would be like kind of difficult to explain. So a lot of people perform an experiment uh, um, basically by asking, asking people to uh, tune like knobs. It was really like, well, this was, was done in the 30s, I think 1931. Uh, I mean, the, the purpose was to create the sensitivity to, the, um, I mean, the response of a, of a human eye to different frequency, and so to map, uh, to map as a given color to a combination of R, G, and B. And, and this is what you get. So basically, once you do, you, you take those, the only thing you can do is, uh, you have to do is just to take those functions, convert them with a spectrum of wh whatever thing is, like whatever color it is, and you will get three numbers, and those three numbers are R, G, and B. So this is, this is what R, G, and B are, basically. And, and those three numbers, uh, as they are like three-dimensional quantity, they can be easily visualized in a three-dimensional space. So like if you visualize RGB in RGB, it's just a cube. So this is RGB. Uh, this is not the most convenient way. I mean, one of the original reasons that uh, prompted to change this representation is that negative numbers were not so uh, uh, good and made you prone to error when you, did, when you had to do all the calculations by hand. So another space was introduced like this XYZ space, which is basically just a linear combination of RGB and is defined, like it's positively, de positively defined, uh, and has like certain better properties. For example, this Y coordinate in the middle is really close to the uh, uh, human sensitivity to the, to the brightness. So it's like kind of a, kind of a brightness measure. So if we, if we look at the, the RGB space in this XYZ space, we see that it's a linear combination, so it's still uh, like rectangular, like so it doesn't have like curve shaped, but it's not a cube anymore. And, and, and we already see what, what's the advantage of having other spaces in color representation. So here, for example, I mean, if we go back, we, we don't have a lightness axis here. So like basically if I go, if I look at fully saturated colors like red, yellow, green, they're all the same. But actually like a color like blue is perceived much darker than, than yellow, for example. 
and, and this I can already notice in this XYZ space because like yellow is up, is up here close to white while blue is down here close to black. And when, once I had this space, from this is kind of like a hub. From this space, I can define all sorts of other spaces. Like one example that you may have seen if you work with color is a chromaticity diagram, which is just basically you, you divide x, y, z uh, um, um, by the sum of x, y, and z, so you kind of normalize the coordinates, and then you just pick two of them, uh, and, and, you, and you, so you, you define this two-dimensional space when you can have this kind of chromaticity diagram. And these three points here are the three uh, coordinates for r, g, and b, so like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, uh, seen in this other space. So basically, if you have this RGB space, oh, okay, let, let, what's, what's the big color part? The big color part is what we can see as human beings. So these are like the, the single frequency colors, and these are all the, the mixture of frequency that we can see. And already we notice that not every color that we can see is representable by RGB. So if you have free source of light, you, you see three sources of light, you cannot represent every color. You, you need like multiple sources, but this is technically inefficient. So it's, it's way better just to use three and, and, and use like this three sensitivity. And so this is like, this is like kind of what's represented. And, and this is also the reason why different monitors with different primaries, they are called, the coordinates of R, G, and B, represent colors differently. So don't, don't trust your monitor when, when you have to send stuff around. And especially when you have to print it because like pigments are, are different kind of primaries here in a totally different position. Um, so that said, why, why should I care? I mean, why should you care? I mean, I care because my job, you care because sometimes uh, things are relevant. Uh, let's, let's look at this stupid example. Here I have two images, like one image composed by two images, green and, 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 and red. Let's do a stupid thing like a mean filter or could be a Gaussian blur or whatever. So this is expected, unexpected. I don't know, at, at first I, I never thought about this problem, but actually, why is it so dark here? I mean, this is green, this is red, they're kind of bright. Here it's going down, why? Because RGB is not linear space, well XYZ is. So if you know about this, this is one reason, for example, why you should, you should care about it. So if, if we perform just a stupid color conversion to XYZ, which is a linear space, it doesn't like uh, encode colors in a, um, Square, like kind of a square root to compression, because this is another topic. I don't want to go too technical, but RGB encodes color in, non, in a nonlinear matter. Uh, so if I do the same thing in XYZ, oh, this is not dark anymore. This is like a nice linear mixture of color. And, and this may be important. It's something that is overlooked by many software. If you, in your Mac, like you have, uh, you change, I don't want to switch folder now, but if you, if you have like foreground and background, the background is blurred. If you blur colors in Photoshop sometimes and you don't know about this, you may just get worse results. This is just because you're doing stuff in the wrong space. So the, the core representation is really, is really important. And, and another stupid example, like let, let's import an image. So this is an image of something, I don't even know what it is. And so let's say that this image is too contrasted. I want to reduce the contrast. So we can reduce contrast in RGB actually. Let's just do this. Okay, I've reduced the contrast, but I don't know. Is it really the proper thing to do? I mean, this is now is really dull. It's, there's a lot of gray in the image. But if I know about color spaces, I may convert to another color space, and then we talk about this, a little bit more about this later. For example, this LCH space is uh, um, lightness, chroma, and hue. So as I have a chroma over saturation as a single like detached parameter, is like uh, orthogonal to the others, I can just uh, reduce that, and I get totally different result. So, and, and these things, are, these are just little things, but of course you can, you can build much more uh, on, on top of this if you, if you know when, uh, like what are the properties of, of your spaces. So, oh, this is, yeah, okay. This is too much, too long, let's see. Uh, let's move briefly um, about how do we represent colors in the Wolfram language. I mean, we have basically uh, uh, three, like, they say two ways of representing color and three concept. And one is color directive that you, you may be familiar with that. It's like when you type like RGB color and then you do like one zero zero with this is red, for example. Or you can say LAB color, more than LAB later, and uh, like something like this. This is another color. 
And so these are color directives. You can use them. You can you can extract the numbers, multiply the other things. Uh, you can place them in images. Um, I mean, you can do all sorts of things. And this is like the like a, the proper color representation. And of course, like this kind of stupid manipulate that shows like what happens when you change the primaries. But I mean, I think everybody's familiar with this. Then we have color in images. So let's get our faithful linear. So okay, this thing is not gonna work in the presentation mode, but uh, if now I go to the normal working mode, I had this uh, image information panel, and I see that, for example, I see a lot of things about it. This is the image histograms, and uh, I, I see that colors are encoded in, in a byte format, so from zero to 255, that they are interleaved, and uh, and this, this space is RGB. And I can even, without calling color convert, I can, I can change the, the sp like, this thing will automatically call color from convert from for me if I just do, for example, something like this. So this is the same image in the LAB space. I mean, it's the same because LAB is bigger than RGB, so I'm not cutting anything. But if I convert, for example, to grayscale, now I'm throwing away information, so I can don't do this if you want to go back. Just save the image. Um, so I mean, I can get the options. So like, uh, this is what happens when I convert, and I can get the data out. And this is not probably so interesting, but. Uh, uh, it's really useful to get image data out if you want to do operations on the single single uh, pixel as number. Um, so let's go back to the presentation here. Uh, that said, we have, um, like space is not really a, a, an object in the Wolfram language, but it's a concept that's really useful. So like we talk about RGB, those those functions that, that I showed before were like the official definition of RGB by, by the, um, the color consortium, international color consortium. But actually that space is kind of big. So uh, as you don't want to, when, when you map from one, I mean, having different primaries means you can represent different colors. So uh, you don't want to, to represent too many colors if you, if you need your images to be compatible with many devices. So the, the industry standard is not that big space, like something that Adobe Microsoft uh, uh, came together to define, and is this sRGB, which is way smaller, and you see it here, and this is what we use internally in Mathematica. So if you wonder what, what is our definition of RGB is sRGB. And, and if you look at sRGB in, um, in different independent spaces, you see, you see basically his property. This is, we, we saw already XYZ. We talked before about uh, LAB, LC, LCH, what, what's that? Basically. Oh, well, this is the 3D representation of, then, then we saw like from the chromaticity diagram that was 2D, this is in 3D, so if I look from above, I see the triangle, and if I look from the side, it's just, this is just the, the projection basically on, on an axis of this one here. So I just divide, normalize, and I get this. This is why it's squashed open at, at the bottom. And, and this is another space, which, this is like, an, an, let's say, an innovation of a, like a, an update of, a, of XYZ, it's called LAB, I don't go into the details, but has a no, lot of nonlinear transformation, and this makes the color representation way closer to what we as human beings perceive. So if I measure, for example, a Euclidean distance in this space, is much closer uh, to the perceived color distance of, of myself as human. And I still have a good property that color are, are like, uh, um, um, properly placed uh, on, on the luminance axis, or like uh, uh, if I go from the center, which is the uh, line of gray color, to the side, I have that chroma measure that I used before. So it's analogous to the saturation somehow. So I can perform all kinds of operation in this space. And it, as the color information is more per perceptually accurate, this is the reason why I was using LAB to cluster colors yesterday in my classifier. So that said, let's, uh, let's quickly move to the, oh, why is this all double? Uh, oh, and then we have like small color utilities that like you probably know about random color. It's quite sophisticated, you can pass also distribution. So like this is one good thing about, like I use L LCH so I can specify an interval of luminance, an interval of chroma, an interval of hue. I, and, and this is quite uh, useful when you have to create color palette. And I have function like color distance, for example, like this is a rose. I can create a mask by uh, defining the color distance from image to, um, to a single color. The, you can just directly use image color, this will automatically thread over all the pixels. And then I can do something like uh, selective desaturation, which is a really popular, uh, uh, let's say, image effect application, just by combining the two. This is something that's really easy to do, like three lines of code in Mathematica, and so you don't have to download your uh, iPhone app. <laughs> or maybe you have, I don't know, whatever. And okay, and this is like was a kind of brief introduction. What was our color and what we can do with them in Wolfram language. Let's go quickly 
super quickly uh, to uh, some application of this. So um, image adjusting. First, uh, first function that, uh, oh here, oh, this part here is kind of sneak peek into 10.2 because all these functions here are at, uh, will be available in 10.2. So white balance, what's, what's white balance? Uh, is strictly uh, like closely related to color processing is like uh, I kind of, mm, um, let's say I, I didn't mention one step before like uh, when I, I talk about like uh, how do you get RGB colors convolving the, a spectrum with those three functions is that usually uh, any like given object here uh, do, um, doesn't emit light. So it's not really emitted light, it's reflected light. So there's a one step in the middle, you, you have uh, like the, the spectrum of your of your uh, like light source, like the sun or, or one, uh, let's say one uh, light bulb or a f uh, fluorescent lamp, whatever. So that is the spectrum. You have to convolve that with the reflectance spectrum of the object and then with the functions. And I mean, given that, so I mean, colors, the, 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 the RGB colors that you get in the end are really dependent on uh, which kind of light source you use. And that's kind of obvious because if you think about it, if you're shining something with a red light, it will look red in the end. I mean, you, you cannot see any other color. And this is the problem with white balancing. I mean, what, what, what happens if you have like a different source of light which is not direct sunlight? The content of the image will be different. I mean, just I, I browsed through the internet before and I, I gather a bunch of, like some are test images from paper, some are just common images from Google images. And, and, but what they have in common is that they are not really well white balanced. I mean, they, 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 are not, they, are not, not, they have not been corrected uh, for improper illumination. So with the white balance function, I'm mean, just showing here, like you have like a lot of methods to uh, correct images. From the stupid one, like this is one here, is, uh, this should be way, way smaller. Uh, let's try this. Mm, still too big. Arr, 80. Bah, okay, so some, some of them are like, quite stupid, for example, this gray scaling is uh, use a really popular assumption, which is a gray word. Let's, so let's say that the average content of a natural image, it has to be gray, but it's not really powerful. So like for, for example, the first image, it can fix it. The second one, yes, this ball, yes, but for many others, like scaling stuff in RGB is not really the proper way to go because you can uh, quickly hit the boundary of that cube and then you have all this clipping. So you can do, I mean, this is really fast, but it doesn't work all the time. Or you can use another assumption, which is like not the average color is gray, but is like at least one object is, is white in, in, in a real world image. This sometimes it justifies, sometimes it's not. Uh, still, I can fix certain images, but for example, this really strong green and blue color cast, uh, they cannot be fixed because there's no, um, basically, if there's just one white pixel, or, or like the, all the, the maximum pixel images are white, I cannot fix it. I can do this scaling not in RGB but in another space. This LMS scaling is just the three function we saw before. It's kind of I move in, the, uh, um, in another space which is kind of a response domain of our uh, cone cells and I do the scaling here. And I think I can get much better result for many images but still I cannot correct every image. Let's see this lab here or this, this woman here. And then the final, final method, the most, most powerful we have here is scaling the chromaticity. What, what is that? Basically is a kind of a gray word assumption, but I don't just uh, multiply colors. I just take out the uh, chromaticity, so not the brightness information, just the color, like the hue information from the image, and I scale that. And this is really powerful, can fix many things, but it requires multiple conversions, so it's generally slower. So other new utilities we have, like I don't know if you're familiar with HDR images, like you can, you can create, HDR is like high dynamic range images, that means that I have a lot of uh, exposure information, different uh, uh, level of brightness, all compacted in one image. The problem is that usually, um, no, that's not important from internet. Usually what I get is something like this, so it's really dark, but if you multiply by something, you see that the color information is there. But uh, like just straight multiplication is never good because I'm burning out all the light arrays. I mean, this is over, overexposed. So what, what you want to do is to tone map the image. And so you just uh, kind of mix locally 
the brightness information from all the areas. And if you don't like it, this has also many methods. We, we, I mean, we could go in details, but you can make it more powerful, less powerful. There are here a lot of methods. You can just scale the RGB primaries. You can scale the luminance of the picture, the logarithm of the luminance. Uh, and you have like some more advanced methods to like divide the luminance in details and base, scale the base, put back the details, or just simulate the analog dodging and burning. So, um, and of course you can correct uh, for like with the parameters, like this log luminance for example was quite dark. You, you cannot fix like automatic parameters for every image. So I prefer to let be, the user fix them themselves uh, beyond a certain level, let's say. So you can make it more powerful, but let's say now it's a bit too desaturated, so I will manually fix the saturation, for example. And, and you can do all sorts of things with this. Another, another really um, in interesting color process application is, which is correlated to, to HDR images, but not strictly the same thing, is uh, ex uh, like image stacking, in this specific case, exposure stacking. So let's say I have a problem that I, I want to see these details at multiple lum luminosity or brightness level but I don't have a like, super uh, sensible sensor like at these different levels, I have just normal camera. So what I can do, I can take multiple pictures at different uh, level of exposure or different uh, time, uh, different aperture. I mean, you, you, can, you can balance those things. And uh, ooh, this I should have saved. Is it connected? Yes. So like these pictures have different level of, of exposure. And uh, what I can do with Mathematica 10.2 is just call one function and combine them in one. This is quite big, so it takes some time, and here it is. So basically, this is, uh, is applying a lot of local filters to get the proper exposure for each image and combining them all together. And uh, another thing that you can do with this, uh, like um, uh, by combining exposure is, let's not go to internet, let's take images from here, because we don't have much time. So yes, you can. So you can like uh, take your, uh, not your average, but like a good underexposed image if you have a good sensor, but will still uh, save. It is, like, an underexposed image is really dark, but has a lot of information in the dark channel. Oh, it's really best. Um, is this coming or no? Who knows? Mm -hmm. I don't know, okay, I will tell you the trick and then this you can show, see for yourself if you download the notebook. So basically what you can do is uh, simulate multiple exposure by, oh no, here it is. So here's the image, this is really dark, but if I multiply this by like different different levels again, I can, I can see that here is not so, I mean, it will burn out faster because this is not HDR. This is like l low dynamic range. But still I can simulate multiple exposure sometimes if the image is not too bad and then combine it to, I mean, I was starting from this and now I have this. So it, it's kind of look kind of fake. This is why a lot of high dynamic range, like kind of high dynamic range images on the web look this way, because they're not really high dynamic range, they are like over compressed or stuff like that. But still you can extract details that you like cannot see in, uh, with the naked eye, let's say, on the picture. Uh, another like kind of not really color processing, but is related to image stacking is focus stacking. So, no, 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 let's not import. Let's, from my hard drive. So this is a fly that I got from Wikipedia. You can get basically, this is instead of different exposure, you have different focal length. So this part here has the front ex uh, in focus, this has the back, and I can just call again image focus combine to combine them, combine them. This is a bit ugly, why? Because images are not aligned, so please remember to align your images. And once you do that, you get this. And you can, uh, uh, this is like macro photography, another popular application of this is microscopy. So let's import this uh, stack of uh, cell images. So this is again three different focus planes. And what I can, this is already aligned, so I don't need, uh, I don't need to align it myself, but I can show you a, bit, a little option here. So I can align really quickly, or I can create multiple maps at multiple uh, resolution level, and, and it will take longer, of course, but let's see the result. So this is first image, second, Third, this is a fast combination, and this is a proper combination with more time. And just to comparison, this is the image I took from Wikipedia as a ground truth. So, I mean, the, I think I even have less ghosting here. But this will get even better for like 10.11 or 2.1 or whatever. It's fairly new and experimental. So that said, uh, I had some example here, but I don't know if I have time to show them. Uh, how much time do I have? Just five minutes. Do you want to see more examples or not? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. So, 
This one here is, um, yeah. So these are more like uh, kind of fun applications. So what, what you can do with the colors, uh, we have a, a colorize function. So like, for example, this is a pattern. And, and if, if you take, do something like, let's say, let's do a segmentation. So this will create a matrix, a matrix of numbers. And like would be like one, two, three. Each component will be labeled with the uh, with the corresponding number. And then you, how, how do you visualize the matrix of, of, of integer components? Usually you call colorize, and you, and you get this. Uh, this is kind of random colors that we picked uh, uh, to be like far apart, but not necessarily beautiful. So what you can do is uh, take like for example inspiration from nature. Like this is a picture of the quince. You can call random colors and create your own rules. So you have something like this. Because usually, I mean, usually it's good to take color from real things because nature tend to be harmonic, or maybe we tend to perceive that as harmonic because it's all around us, whatever. So you can do these kind of things. And I have many examples here, but I'm not going through all of them because we don't have time. Uh, and other things you can do is, for example, let's take this uh, Marilyn Moreau image. This one I stole from Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. And uh, what you can do is to take out color information and then again use a real world image. Let me again I will do segmentation and I use the real world image to get some color rules and then up my homemade pop art. Um, and then here I directly I'm still in Marcus. This is Marcus running. So uh, thanks again, Marcus. Uh, what is this? Oh, sorry. This is a, a video of Marcus after his run, his morning run. And uh, what we want to do here is to use the color information on his face to measure his pulse after the run. And how do we do that? I mean, uh, first we have like a bunch of regularization. Uh, we extract his face, we measure, we extract the skin. I don't want to show all of this. I mean, it's all in the notebook, but uh, for example, uh, let's say these are all the faces. These are re regularized faces. Mm. Skin classifiers, skin weight. Okay, so let's show this, for example. So this is like by taking with a manual mask, I select, uh, selected the um, um, skin pixel in the picture, and then by taking the average of that over all the images of aligned faces, that you can align yourself with scope before, uh, you can get kind of the average, uh, um, like let's say, skin mask of Marcus' face. So when, when I had this, I can just extract the LAB signal. So uh, from the, um, so the, the, the color information from the, the pixel of the face. Uh, we don't really care about the lightness here. This is why we go to uh, LAB, because so we can use A and B. So we have two colors. Let's try to, com two colors channel. Let's try to combine them in the most um, like uh, information rich way. So we find the optimal mixing angle and now we get something which looks a bit more, this is just a, a, a linear combination for A and B. This looks a lot more now like a pulse. Still, we want to um, clean the, the signal a little, so we use a bandpass filter in order to get the proper frequency into account. We find the peak of, of, of those frequencies. So now we have basically two different oscillations. One, my guess, is the breath. So while, while you are breathing, uh, uh, your, your skin color will change. One is a pulse, it's much faster. It's like every time the, there's more blood in your face, you will get redder. And so let's try to get the, the time difference between all these peaks. So we extract the time difference. We convert the delta t to seconds. We get some standard deviation. And then what we can do is we can just measure the pulse. So this is 82 beat per minute. It was the pulse of Marcus uh, after his run. And uh, the run is done. I'm done because the end is out there. Thanks for your attention.